Okay, um, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Wojtek Tyczyński. Uh, I'm on the TL of six scalability and together with like Shiam Gunta, um, who is like one of our chairs, uh, we are going to make this uh, SIG update, six scalability update today. Um, so let's start with, uh, with clarifying like with what exactly do we focus in this SIG. Um, and there are like f four main and like one additional thing that we are primarily doing. Like the first thing is uh, driving and defining, defining really, and uh, what Kubernetes scalability really means, what dimensions it has, uh, what do we really care about, and, and what are our goals here. Second is like measuring where we are um, with respect to those, those, those goals. Third is ensuring that we actually meet the goals by, by contributing and improving the system, contributing improvements to the system and improving the system. Um, and finally, preserving that we actually don't regress from, from that point over time. Um, and the fifth thing that I mentioned that is a little bit orthogonal here is also um, coaching and consulting like the, the overall community um, on how to, how, to, how to put scalability into their designs, how to think about scalability when implementing their, 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 um, their features and so on and so on. So um, one thing that is worth mentioning is like, um, uh, you shouldn't confuse SIG scalability with SIG auto scaling. It, it happens a lot. Scalability SIG is, is about like how far in a certain dimensions you can go, like how big cluster you can have, how many pods per second you can schedule, how many load balancers you can have, and so on and so on. Auto scaling is more about like dynamically adjusting both the cluster or what is happening in the cluster to accommodate the load. For example, cluster auto scaler is, is um, scaling the size of the cluster like by adding or removing nodes. Um, horizontal pod autoscaler is like adding pods based on traffic and so on and so on. Um, so it's, it's, this part is a different SIG. Here we are focusing on, on scalability. Um, okay, so let's go over them like one by one. So scalability definition. What is Kubernetes scalability? Um, the important thing that in general is, is you need to keep in mind for any scalability or like performance improvement, related improvements, is that we shouldn't be optimizing the system or pushing the limits like for the sake of doing that. Like we should, like every, every such change is making the system a little bit more complex. So like we should always be anchoring in, in actual user requirements and actual user needs. So um, if we ask users like, what they really want in terms of scalability, like they want scalable clusters, but um, what does it really mean? They don't really know it. Um, in fact, they don't, in many cases, they don't want to know it because Kubernetes is like their tool on top of which they build their businesses. So they don't want to understand every single detail of, of the underlying infrastructure. They just want it to know. Uh, they just want, want it to work. Um, so historically, we were like uh, we are thinking about scalability of Kubernetes as the number of nodes in the cluster, like how how many nodes the cluster has. But it's while it's it's very important dimension, very critical for many many users. It's only like small part of the the actual truth. Um, scalability um, of Kubernetes is in fact like a multi-dimensional problem. There are many many dimensions that really matter on uh, if, um, how, how well your cluster will be behaving, if it will be able to run your workloads. Things like um, pod churn, number of pods per node, number of services, number of load balancers, and so on and so on. Like there are dozens of those dimensions that, that, matter, um, that matter here. Uh, so what is this scalability envelope? It's effectively like a zone or a like subset, subspace in which your cluster stays happy. What does it mean the cluster is happy? It means that like the scalability or in general the SLOs are satisfied. Um, Kubernetes isn't doing like a perfect job in defining um, SLOs. In fact, 
I think like scalability related, uh, scalability related ones are the only ones that like we as a community have defined. So, but it, it, in general, like it, we should be talking about any, any SLOs that are defined for a given project. Um, so what are SLOs? I hope, and SLIs, what, I hope you, you already you, um, know those terms, but like ser SLI is service level indicator. You can think about it as a metric. Um, and SLO is like service, service level objective. You can think about it as like that metric plus some threshold below which like the, the system is, is healthy. And for Kubernetes, we actually have like two really mature SLOs, for, uh, for startup latency and API call latency. We have few more that we are and sorry, taking taking a step back, like those two are are like really things that we measure, things that are uh, well tested. Uh, they are like regressions on those are blocking releases and so on and so on. We have a couple more, um, primarily in the networking area that are we are already measuring. We have defined SLIs for them, but we don't really have defined SLOs. We didn't graduate them. Um, we are not closely monitoring them and so on and so on. So um, given that um, at least some of those, like for example, DNS part is like super important in AI ML workloads, um, which Kubernetes is more and more looking at. Um, there's a bunch of work that we need to do here to actually improve it. Uh, and the first step would be to graduating and maturing those SLO and starting to, to, to rely on those really. Um, so maybe just a, just a quick uh, case study, like um, defining SLOs is not easy. Um, in the, in, on the top, you can see um, um, how the first definition of the API call latency looked like um, from my blog post in 2015, so like almost 10 years ago. Um, um, this is how it currently looks like, um, the definition below. So the, I, I'm not going to, to, we don't have time to go into details here, but um, we clarified a bunch of things. We split it SLI and SLOs explicitly. We clarified which API calls matter, how they are aggregated, um, how we are aggregating over time, um, over what time, and, and so on and so on. Um, so, in the end, what matters for, for users are two things. Um, so first is like, what do we guarantee? Um, and th those are exactly the SLOs. And the second thing is like, what are the limits of the system? So what, what, how exactly this like scalability envelopes looks like? Looks like. Um, the problem is that like defining it pre precisely is pretty much impossible. Um, fortunately, we have like reasonable approximation of that. Um, things like number of nodes uh, not greater than 5,000, number of services not greater than 10,000. We know many more. Um, you can take a look into this link from the slides. Um, there are still many TBDs there. Um, some of them we just need to document better. Some of them we still need to understand better. So there's still a lot of work here. Um, so if you, if you are interested in, in this kind of work, like we have a lot of place where you can help here. Um, and with that, uh, we are going to the second category. So I, I'm passing now to Shyam. All right, thanks Wojtek. Um, as many of you would have probably seen it by now, it's a pretty ambitious charter that we've got um, for the SIG. Um, it's a pretty broad scope because it covers um, multiple aspects of the cluster because scalability is not really about a specific feature or a specific component, but it's really a property of the system. Um, so how do we actually execute on this charter? Um, and the answer is it's, it's through a combination of tools, test frameworks, as well as processes uh, that we've built and evolved in-house on the SIG over the years. Um, Let's actually look into what those are, and some of those might be pretty useful for you as well if you're, uh, if you're trying to run some scalability tests or evaluate the performance of your cluster and stuff. So um, I'll start with this. This is probably the most important uh, tool we use. It's our primary tool 
Uh, again, it's, it's built completely in-house within the Kubernetes project and in this SIG. It's called Cluster Loader 2. Um, essentially, it makes it possible to write scale tests in a declarative form. And this is something we've actually learned the hard way over the years, uh, writing writing end-to-end -end tests, because scalability tests are mostly end-to-end -end tests or integration tests, and they can be pretty hard and detail-oriented to write, um, especially the way you simulate creation of workloads, the rate at which you do that, um, um, the kind of interactions you uh, you emulate. It, it can be pretty complex, and over time, it was becoming unmanageable for us to write kind of write uh, imperative tests, which were basically Go files. So we came up with this uh, tool, which essentially models your test um, as a sequence of well-known operations, um, such as create a set of deployments uh, in this namespace at this given rate. So you can define uh, functions for what sort of rates at which you want to induce load. You can define what sort of things you can create. Uh, uh, and, the best, and the best part is you can even uh, leverage some built-in measurement functions that we already uh, use heavily within the SIG, or you can also extend it because this tool is pretty modular. Um, and all of this, basically makes it easy as a user if you were to use this tool to kind of define your own tests and extend it to new use cases. Uh, there's a link at the bottom. Uh, you probably will be able to download it. Uh, sorry, sorry, open it from, from PDF. All right, so the next tool up our sleeve. This is a pretty powerful tool, too. It's called Cubemark. Um, essentially, it's a cluster simulation. What it does is... Um, it kind of brings scalability testing within the grasp of a common man because uh, the the thing that deters most um, teams or companies or even uh, individual developers is not being able to afford uh, huge amounts of compute uh, and access to those sort of resources that we use within the SIG for running the uh, scale tests in the project, right? So, so essentially it lets you uh, simulate the behavior of a real cluster uh, specifically in terms of the traffic pattern that is received by the control plane by creating fake implementations of uh, kubelet, kubeproxy, and those sort of components which, um, yeah, which essentially run as pods. So the, the whole blue octagon that you see, uh, that represents the base cluster, which is, uh, which is where you actually run real Kubernetes control plane and real Kubernetes nodes. And then you launch these hollow nodes uh, as pods on top of these nodes, which then act as nodes of uh, an overlay cluster that we're building, which is the Kubemark cluster, and make it talk to the a new Kubernetes control plane. So yeah, it's, it's also a pretty powerful paradigm. Uh, if you've ever played around with it, um, you'd, you'd probably know the, know the power that it gives you, as well as some of the limitations that come with it. Um, Okay, so we've talked about the tools that we use to actually uh, run these stress tests and kind of create these scalable clusters, right? How, as, as the next step, how do we actually um, make use of these, right? Like now, great, we have a cluster, we have these tests running. Uh, how are we actually going to measure performance and like kind of monitor uh, things like memory usage, CPU usage, and stuff? And stuff. So there also we've kind of built a whole... Um, whole set of uh, observability and debugging toolkit uh, within the SIG. The first one is Perf Dash, which is, uh, I put a screenshot here, and there's a link at the bottom. It's a public uh, URL where you can access it. Um, it essentially shows various kinds of metrics of individual components and um, systems within your, within your cluster, as well as end-to-end -end metrics, like pod startup latency, um, um, maybe DNS latency, I'm not sure, but stuff like that. So. Uh, yeah, and we, uh, the x-axis essentially is over time uh, as we keep uh, running these job over and over again. These are the metrics uh, that we see. Um, these are the values that we see for the metrics, and it is pretty useful for us to also inform about things like how the patterns of various API metrics uh, and performance of various components change over time as we optimize certain things or we make larger changes uh, maybe architectural changes and stuff. 
And the next one is for each of the test runs uh, for these large cluster test uh, jobs that we run, uh, we dump the whole set of Prometheus metrics from the control plane components and uh, a bunch of uh, uh, Kubernetes components on the nodes too as Prometheus snapshot, uh, basically for the metrics that are captured through the job run. And if you want access to them, you can essentially use these with a, bring up your own Grafana UI instance and point them to the, the, to the metric snapshot and you'll be able to see how, um, how these things work. And the, the final one is uh, profiling. This is uh, basically for the more savvy um, profesh scalability or performance um, experts. We use these uh, sometimes when things go south and let's say we've, uh, we've run into unusual API latencies and we cannot quite explain it with, uh, with logs and metrics or let's say we see that processes get um killed because the memory kept growing. So for this, we also capture the um, CPU profile, memory profile. I believe we also have the ability to uh, get lock profiles lock con for uh, measuring how bad lock contention is. Um, and these are again also part of the, uh, the output that these test runs spew. Okay, so now we've spoken about the toolkit. We've spoken about uh, how we can actually go around observing and debugging scalability. Now, what does the SIG actually do in ensuring um, that the Kubernetes project continues to scale um, to, to basically 5,000 nodes and all the other dimensions that Wojtek mentioned um, earlier? The first one is we, we capture the various scalability properties of uh, of a Kubernetes cluster through a series of uh, test jobs. Um, these again, there's, there are kind of two dimensions around, uh, around these. The first one is the scale at which we run these. Uh, we, we don't just run the 5,000 node uh, cluster test because it takes a while. It is expensive and also the feedback loop is slower for it. So we kind of complement that with a bunch of smaller scale tests that we run more aggressively to kind of catch regression sooner. Uh, some of those are also done as a pre-submit. So if you submit a PR to the Kubernetes project, you essentially are evaluated against at least a 100 node cluster, um, uh, for instance. And the other dimension for these tests is what they actually exercise, right? And what sort of things they actually uh, make sure that uh, they scale. And this includes a whole uh, a slew of different um, test suites that basically come from different SIGs and things like storage, network, uh, various benchmarks like for scheduler, um, for DNS, and stuff like that. We'll talk about that uh, in a sec too. But yeah, so we've got this whole battery of tests. Okay. I hit the wrong button. And yeah, so uh, this this is the test grid again. There's a link at the bottom. Um, this uh, the six scalability tab. Essentially, if you go there, it'll show you this whole slew of the uh, tests, test suites that we run. And it's pretty diverse in the sense that um, it runs on different kinds of um, um, compute. Like it runs on EC2, it also runs on uh, GCP and CubeMark tests as well, as, uh, as well as they, they test different kinds of things. Like uh, for instance, we, we run tests against the tip of Golang version that we use. Uh, to the point that we've actually caught regressions with um, with Golang in the past with the Kubernetes scale tests and have them make changes in response to those. Um, similarly, uh, we have a bunch of benchmarks and experiments, and you can see many of the experimental tests are failing. Um, I guess probably because they're experiments that make sense. Um, but yeah, I'll definitely encourage uh, anyone who's interested to understand deeper about what uh, what sort of things we cover here to take a look at that uh, dashboard. And with that, I'm really, really excited and happy to announce on behalf of the SIG that we have recently started running um, 
the 5,000 node scale test upstream as part of uh, AWS2. This comes in as a huge news for, for the SIG uh, for a few different reasons. Uh, the first and the foremost one is it essentially finally helps us to decentralize these tests, have them run on multiple providers, uh, have, have multiple people develop expertise on running these tests, the infrastructure, and being able to debug um, issues, as well as it allows us to vet different kinds of infrastructure. So there are some differences, for instance, uh, how the AWS uh, test runs. It uses COPS, uh, and the GCP tests run using different bootstrap scripts. So th um, the idea is to actually use both these tests uh, fungibly, as in uh, both of these provide signal to the Kubernetes release uh, as in how good we are doing and are we doing well. And being able to use this fungibly is really powerful because sometimes when we run into an issue with one particular setup, we can kind of uh, have the other one as a hot standby and like increase and decrease their frequencies and uh, along the way uh, gather all these benefits that I just mentioned. Um, cool. So, okay, so now we also have CI tests for scalability that are continuously running. Um, how do we make use of these? How do we leverage these? So there are two themes, high-level themes. One of them is we use them to catch regressions, and these are used to basically ensure uh, that we launch releases of high quality, um, as well as in general, uh, the, other, the other thing that I was talking about is be able to catch uh, general performance bottlenecks in the clusters through the metrics and the profiles and stuff that uh, I mentioned earlier. And uh, yeah, so sc scalability was a pretty broad horizontal uh, property of the system. And we discussed about this earlier. And indeed, it is pretty sensitive to um, all sorts of things. Like you can have a scalability regression come from pretty much anywhere uh, across your cluster, up and down the stack. For instance, uh, we've seen some really interesting um, performance regressions with Golang releases, which explains why we added them as tests um, later on. Um, and quite often, these are actually uh, things that within Golang, they don't actually change semantics or some of the API behaviors and stuff uh, of the programming language, but they, let's say, change the underlying implementations of, of something. For instance, we, once we've seen that, um, the net HTTP library, there was a function uh, for uh, HTTP to serve, uh, which essentially in the default implementation in Golang, they added a new case to a switch statement, which seemed pretty much harmless at the time, but it kind of ended up blowing up uh, the whole cluster and um, we kind of went back to them, got it fixed. And similarly, yeah, they, they could even come from operating system, things like your sys, uh, syscuttle settings, um, your cloud provider, like how your controllers are written, the kind of traffic they induce on the control plane. Um, and, the, and then the most common categories, which is the API machinery and etcd. There are a few examples of issues uh, that interesting issues that we recently caught. I'll talk about uh, for those in the next slide. But yeah, for these regressions, we end up catching them quite with quite a good success rate uh, in these tests. And many times we uh, debug themselves, uh, debug them ourselves, and try to fix them. Or uh, often we also um, try them to other six because it's all around the stack, right? Um, okay, so these are probably issues from within the last six months to one year. Uh, they kind of highlight different flavors, different nuances of the issues we run into. Um, it's a super hyperlinkified slide, so I'm sorry if. Uh, it's all too blue for you, but um, I just kept the links in there in case anyone wants to actually go in and, and see what those issues were about. So uh, the first one, this is a rather more uh, a rather newer issue where we saw that the um, under certain load patterns uh, for newer versions of Kubernetes, when a client was making a watch request to the API server, Kubernetes client, uh, without specifying a resource version, um, we see that some of the watch events were being lost, they were being missed. And uh, we kind of did a whole drill around this to try to get to a repro. And essentially, what we found out was um, when many of such watch requests on a high churn cluster, let's say you have so many pod mutations happening, uh, arrive at the API server at once, 
And when combined with uh, this resource version not being provided, it basically, the behavior is the API server forwards those watch requests to etcd, and all these watches get multiplexed onto a single gRPC stream. And the way uh, etcd handles these watches kind of makes, makes that, um, has certain inefficiencies that were basically highlighted by this um, issue. So it exposed a whole bunch of things. Uh, it kind of is a regression because it uh, came up as a consequence of us fixing a bug or fixing a property in the API server, uh, but uh, it did expose a whole bunch of latent issues with etcd. Um, similarly, there, there are other issues around uh, things which may have been, are not technically regressions, there may have been issues for a while, but uh, we did end up catching those through either tests um, or, or basically experiments. Uh, and we use them to essentially improve our uh, performance for Kubernetes users around it. Um, all right, with that, I think I'll hand it over. Oh, sorry, I think I, think I have another slide, sorry. So quickly, um, all right, so another thing we continue to keep doing is we are adding more and more to this test suite. We are imp improving these coverage, especially as new uh, use cases evolve, like the AIML use cases, for instance, that uh, Wojtek mentioned, they require us to uh, be able to handle high throughputs being able to handle high steady state of large number of nodes running in a cluster and so on. Um, things like HPA, uh, DNS that Wojtek mentioned. I believe he said some of those were work in progress, but we might have merged them more recently. So, uh, yeah, I think that's... Thank you, Sian. Uh, yes, we have DNS, we just are not blocking release from that on the regression. So. Um, Okay, so going a little bit into like the, the last category of driving scalability improvements, there are basically two, two main um, buckets of, of things that we are doing in this area. First are like improving reliability at scale without really pushing the, pushing the limits. Um, effectively, you can think about scalability as uh, reliability at scale. So um, those are ensuring that like your clusters, uh, your cluster keeps keeps running and keeps, uh, keeps, uh, keeps being healthy um, within, the, uh, within, within the existing limits, but under like new circumstances, under when the upgrades are happening and so on and so on. Um, and the second, second area is like pushing the limits, um, which is pretty clear what it means. Um, so most of like, given the six scalability doesn't own re any like production code. Um, pretty much all of those improvements are joined with some other six. Most of them, um, or maybe even currently all of them, or almost all of them at least, um, are joined with like SIG API machinery and SIG etcd. Um, so just looking into some examples, some most notable examples from the like, um, what is happening now and what was happening in the last like couple months, um, we finally, G8 API priority and fairness in 129 in December after four years ish. Like I think we started like the first alpha release was 117, so like it it was a long journey. But like I fi we finally G8 it. it. It doesn't mean it's perfect, but it's it's um, it certainly um, is is in a reasonable shape now. So and we have a stable API. Um, there were a bunch of like improvements to upgrade experience. More is coming. There are some caps that are being worked on now that will that will help with another um, another parts of like upgrade experience. Uh, graceful shutdown is one one of the, the the biggest example that that we that we've visibly improved over the past couple of releases. Um, and there are two more things that are worth mentioning here. Um, one is uh, consistent list from cache. Um, we know that uh, etcd is one of our biggest bottlenecks in the system to, for pushing the, the, the boundaries, pushing the limits, um, the limits uh, farther. Uh, so effectively, as, as much load as we can offload from etcd and serve it from, from API server caches, the, the, the farther the system can go. Um, and consistent list from caches is, is one of the biggest improvements in this area, like um, currently we can serve list requests from the cache, but like we don't guarantee any consistency for them. 
Um, with this improvement, we will be able to ensure that they are consistent. Um, we were planning to, to have it beta in 130, but unfortunately due to some issues on the etcd side itself, like namely with the feature that we are heavily rely here, um, the progress notify features on etcd, the, our testing uncovered like some corner cases that are not handled well, so like we need to postpone it and, and fix those issues first. Um, and the second thing in, in here that is worth mentioning is like streaming lists. Um, it was similar, it, it's very similar situation. We were planning to get beta in 130. It's not because we are relying on exactly the same feature from etcd. Um, but uh, what, what it does, it effectively allows us to, to, uh, to mitigate or work around a little bit the limits of how large the response can be uh, and so on by using watch protocol to actually stream the contents of the list. So from the user perspective, they will get exactly the same, but like we will, we will, be, we will be using a different protocol here. And from like pushing the limits category, uh, like the, the most important ones are around like improving CRD scalability. Um, scalability of CRDs is one of the biggest problems that we have comparing to built-in resources that like we still um, need to take that into account. Uh, we are working on, uh, on introducing binary encoding for CRDs. Currently CRDs are only like JSON, only support JSON protocol. Um, the CBOR based encoding is happening. We are again planning for alpha and 130. It, it, it missed that unfortunately. Um, there were a couple more like um, more localized improvements for both like CRD scalability for like uh, but but also like other more generic improvements for like faster compression um, and so on and so on. Uh, one thing that is not in the slide but is probably also worth worth mentioning is the like, uh, open API improvements. Like we those aren't necessarily. Um, focused on like the largest clusters, but it, but they help a lot for um, how the open API, how many open, how many resources open API generation uses. And finally, like that, the, there are a bunch of uh, improvements towards high pod throughput, which is very important use case for AML training in particular, for example. And I think that's, that's all what we have here. Like, um, if you are interested in this area more, um, we have uh, bi-weekly public meetings, uh, we have Slack channel, we have mailing list, so please um, come and join and help us with making all this happen. Um, yes, thank you. And I think we still have two minutes, so like if there's any question. Yeah, two questions, uh, Yuan Chen from NVIDIA. Firstly, do you think the current definition scope or the scaling test can apply to running emerging AI workload in GPU clusters? Or in particular regarding the reliability, we know the GPU cluster is very and uh, not reliable at all. So any plan and uh, on the GPU cluster, AI, ML workload, scaling test or tooling support? Um, we would love to. Uh, I think the problem here is obtainability of GPUs. Like it's, they are like super expensive. So those tests will also be super expensive. So um, if we have those, if we can get those resources, sure, we can definitely do that. I think the problem is having those resources to be able to test on those. Okay. Or simulating it somewhere else, which um, if someone have time and ideas how to do that, then like we would definitely appreciate the help here. Okay, yeah, and that's my follow-up question. I think uh, class node, uh, to my best knowledge, have some kind of the fault injection kind of feature. Any update plan? Because that's something probably I think we can do and uh, yeah, simulate the GPU thing, the other thing. Is that something you think could be valuable? So, yes, I think like there are many places where we can mm -hmm improve stuff. Um, it's a matter of like having capacity to do that. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I would love those to happen. If there's anyone who can help with that, like we definitely can help with making that happen from like 
um, guiding, helping with reviews, and so on. Okay, great. So finally, and uh, how do you compare the Cuba market with the Cork, which is definitely we see and uh, yeah receive an increasing adoption. And uh, do you think uh, potential can integrate the Cork into the scalability testing, replace even Cuba mark? I think we should think how to converge those two into something, a single thing, yes. Uh, I didn't have time to look into that any in the past few months, so. Um, but I definitely would like to converge and have like a single thing instead of like evolving two things in parallel that effectively serve the same purpose. Okay, great, thank you very much. Okay, I think we are out of time. So thank you very much once again. And um, if you have any other questions, like we are both here, um, like feel free to catch us during the conference somewhere on the corridor. So thank you.